Welcome to another edition of Super 7. This is a show where we ask a current or former rider um, to go through his ultimate dream team, his Super 7. My name is John McGilvery. And my name is Liam Rudden. Yes, welcome along to another Super 7 where we ask some of the best known names in Speedway for their dream team, whether it be a childhood hero, a trusted teammate or a legend of the track, the choice is theirs. And uh, we have some legends in the show today to introduce our special guest, John. Yeah, we'd like to welcome along to Super 7 uh, a former Premier League winner and the current Australia and Australian Under-21 team manager, Mark Lemon. Mark, thank you for joining us. No worries, guys. It's a pleasure. Hope you're all well. All good here. Um, you know, we spoke very briefly there. Um, 2020 has been a bit of a washout, um, certainly for Speedway-wise. We've only managed to run a couple of junior meetings up here in Scotland. How has it been for you this year? Yeah, like everyone, it's been frustrating. Um, and, you know, being testing, I guess. Uh, but, you know, we've sort of made the best of a bad thing, I guess. not. I've been a bit fortunate in the sense that uh, I've been, had some work with Bellevue and we've had something to get our get our hands into. And, and I guess our focus at, at, in Bellevue was the uh, to keeping that continuous, uh, longest continuous Speedway Club running record in, intact. And uh, so that really drove us. So that gave us something to, to get, you know, it's, you know, sink our teeth into. So it's, it's been, you know, been flat out the last couple of months. But, you know, obviously before that, you know, it's just watching those coronavirus updates and, you know, the daily news. And it's just like everybody else sort of like hoping that the virus would disappear and, and how do we deal with it. But, yeah, it's been testing. And next season, obviously, all eyes are now on that. All the Speedway for this year is done and dusted. Um you know, what are the thoughts going into next year? Are we everything in place that we can hopefully get uh, some sort of full season at least? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we still got to, you know, put contingency plans in place because nobody knows what the, the norm's going to look like um, come March. So we just really got to sort of focus and start planning for those uh, a bit, bit of normality and, and have to, like, deal with whatever is dished up at a certain time. So, yeah, the, like, you know, the season's now come to the end of the, the brief season that it was. Um, and yeah, and they're all sort of focus and tensions now, you know, firmly, you know, looking at 2021 and, and how we, we go about, you know, building and structuring that. And do you have, uh, do you have a number of different options, Mark, depending on how the, uh, the, the pandemic evolves over the next few months? It's very difficult to, to put a uh, finger on, on exactly how, you know, your, your contingency plans would be, a bit like this year, really, you know, we, but we did actually put down a, you know, some plans, but, you know, it was very difficult for a lot of clubs to, to come to the, to the tapes without any, any fans being there, you know, financially, you know, first and foremost, and also the, you know, the availability of the riders. So uh, next year we've got, you know, a bit of a curveball with um, Poland, you know, having some rider restrictions on some of the, the leagues that have been, you know, that, that'll come to light uh, in the next sort of week or so. But, um, yeah, there's more challenges to, and hurdles to overcome, um, but we're, we're dealing that with the best um, you know, way forward, I, I guess, and we're getting our heads together and, and uh, having those big round table talks and trying to work out what's the, the best solution we can come up with and um, and hopefully that, you know, it'll be good and, you know, we'll, we'll get a league and, you know, it'll be a competitive one at that. As Australian team manager as well, Mark, you know, it must be, it must be one, a very difficult job, but it must be a very exciting job as well. You're involved in the national team and the under-21 team, Um you know, we're always very lucky over here in the UK that the, the, the best Australian riders want to come over and ride here. Um, how much of a headache is there for you to pick, you know, just a small number of these guys and, and go to these major events? Yeah, I, I guess it, it goes back a little bit more than that, really, because obviously with the visa situation, it's been, you know, more apparent over the years. It's got tighter and tighter uh, with government sort of allowing, you know, employment um, and visas. Uh, so there's that side of the fence that you know we've got to look at, and I work closely with the BSPA there as well, and obviously with you know foreign uh, leagues uh, also. But yeah, it, it it kind of tends to you know the, the, the teams pick themselves, you know, and like you know I, I just turn up really just to sort of manage the team on the, on the day, so to speak. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of logistic work that goes in behind the, the scenes. Um, you know, and this year was a you know probably a lot more work went in. Uh, for you know, a lot less uh, action that we, we witnessed. Um, I mean, look, with our under twenty one team, uh, that was always going to be. It's always challenging for us to to field an under twenty one team, and I've always been very 
uh, focal towards my federation that we, we should continue to submit an under-21 team in the world competition. Um, you know, it, it becomes very tight on funds and obviously the availability of the riders, but, you know, there's no other team outside of Europe that competes in that world level, that, that, that age group. And I think it's fundamental that uh, you, you give these kids the opportunity to rub shoulders with, you know, hopefully they're, they're rivals in year to come, at, you know, at, at senior level and on the international scene. Um, but we we, uh, we drew the semi-final in the Czech Republic at part of it. Um, and the original format was, uh, they, they changed it to a three-rider format um, with seven teams. So it was a bit like a pairs event, but you, know, you could use the three riders um, to, to get more nations in. Um, but with the pandemic, you know, the few other nations pulled out. Germany just sort of, you know, point blank just said, we're not sending any teams to international uh, events. Um, so they, they changed the format and we, we only had three riders in Europe and they turned it back to the old four-man four team um, uh, four-rider lineup. So that made, gave us a, you know, a conundrum to, to send a, a, you know, basically a, you know, a non-competitive team. And, um, yeah, my federation just says that we, we can't send an un, uncompetitive team to a world championship, which you know, I had, had no defence in sort of, um, you know, going, going against them. So we had to withdraw from that competition, which was, you know, disappointing. Uh, but you know, it was, it was the right decision. So yeah, but on the senior side, it's never a drama. The boys are sort of generally want to do it. Okay, this year we had one rider that didn't want to do it, but you know, it's it's unprecedented times, um, and you know, like we, we just deal with you know what we what, how we how we the best we could this year. Have a look at your um, your ultimate one to seven then, um, Mark. Um, it's a, a fairly cosmopolitan um, lineup. Um, we've got one Swede. Um, a couple of Australians, a couple of Americans, a Dane and a British rider in there. Before we go into that one, how would you describe it? What's been your thought process behind the one to seven? They're pretty damn good, these riders. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, as, as, all the, the guys I've, I've selected is the guys that I've, in my era, that, that I've raced against. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I've got some standby riders that obviously that, um, you know, I didn't race really against or you know but i still sort of had you know a worship or you know a hero status and uh you know you know think highly of but yeah like the team yeah they're just some of the best of the best basically and like you know when i ever raced against them you know i certainly looked up to them uh you know probably ate a lot of their, their dirt as well but um you know when you you rock up to these tracks and you, you race against some of these top guys that you know you know world champions you know they've got an, an aura about them and, and a, a belief that you know you just kind of wish you could have that and, uh, and try to rub shoulders and to, you know hopefully that will rub off, off on you but um no, i think you know as you as i'll explain they're, they're, they're pretty handy uh, operators we'll start with your, your, your first rider then um we go to sweden um for this one he's a six time world champion and uh, not a bad way to start your one to seven who have we got at number one uh tiger tony Rickardson. um one of the best riders that you know I've I've raced and come across, um, you know, and, and and he was just a cool dude. You know, I think probably not too many people know that, but uh, you know, really competitive, but just a good guy to be hanging out with or play golf with or you know be on a road trip with, and and he, he could party as good as any of them. So you know, like you know, when he to go and do, be as successful as he's done and, and be such a cool guy. You know, you got to tip your hat, you know, to him. But um, and he, you know, he, he just had that flair, didn't he? You know, he was like just brilliant. Like you know, he had the, the, all aspects covered. But you know, he sort of a bit of a game changer. You know, he brought the motorhomes in. Um, you know, and just just you know, set the scene alight with the Grand Prix. But uh, you know, I, I just remember the one year in 1998. I, I had the wood on Tony. You know, in Sweden, Poland, and England. Uh, yeah, so I beat him. I think it was like eleven out of twelve times, but he went on to win everything that year. Um, but you know, you know, that's my claim to fame. I beat him a couple of times, but he won the world championships. So. <laughs> you you said a bit about these world champions having a presence, having something special about them that you hope would rub off on you. Can you quantify that, Mark? Can you say what that was? Uh, it's so much for me, like, I, I was always kind of like happy to be racing motorbikes. Um, and I never really sent the, the benchmark or the, the ambition high enough. Um, and probably, you know, in hindsight, you know, that's a mistake, but these guys had it about them. They, they, they knew they were good. They, you know, could 
they wanted, they had that, that, they were driven, they probably worked harder than, you know, I did and they probably, you know, had better equipment than I did. But like, you know, they, they made that happen, you know, that just didn't happen. It wasn't a fluke, you know, and, um, and I, I probably didn't really appreciate it at the time because I was just riding my motorbike thinking my natural talent would be enough, but you, you need to have that something a little bit special. And, and they just wanted it more. And, you know, like when you watch them and their worth ethic and, um, but yeah, they, they just had an abundance of talent too, which, you know, like, you, you know, I would never sort of compare my talent to Tony Ricard's, that's for sure. But, um, you know, he, he was just, he, he was a bit of a game changer. And like I said, you know, you, you rocked up, you know, and it was just so the riders would look at Tony different. The mechanics would look at Tony's crew different. You know, the fans would you know, treat him different, you know, but yeah. You know, just he was a cool guy, just a normal good guy. You know, next year you parked in the pits next to him, so and he'd, he'd help you and he'd advise you, but you still go out there and smoke it in, in a race. So. And how much of that was down to confidence, then, Mark? A lot, a lot. You know, like I think um, any rider that or any sportsman really, you know, you've, you've really got to tr truly believe in yourself and, and back yourself, and you have doubts. You know, there's. I think even the top riders, even you know, the great Tony Ricards, I'm sure he had days where he doubted himself that uh, he was you know, worthy of being at the tapes. But um, I, I think that's the difference. I think, you know, these guys just, um, yeah, well, you know, their network was better or, or whatever it was. They just had something a bit special and, and they could find that and deliver that uh, when they needed it to and, and more often than not. Now you've got another uh, world champion at number two, this time, it's a three times world champion. I have. Um, it's not really in any particular riding order, but like it'd be a nice little uh, heat one to start with this guy, with Tony. <laughs> um, now, a good friend of mine. Uh, I grew up with him, um, so we're like being best buddies. We've never had a bad word in, in you know, all our years that we've been friends. So that that's uh, Jason Crump. You know, like uh, three times you know world champion, and you know probably possibly could have been four times. You know, you know could have gone the other way, but um, yeah, he was just. <sighs> Like I said, I grew up with a family, so I, I kind of knew he was just sort of born into this world to be world champion, and that's something I never possessed um, or, or thought was possible. But like they, he knew what he Jason wanted from you know first day I knew him anyway. That um, you know we raced junior speedway at the Majuro Motorcycle Club, um, and then we we travelled you know to, to to Europe and and raced on the continent and stuff like that, and sort of become com competitors on an international stage. But we, we've always remained close friends. Um, you know, I think when he, he spoke to me in January about making the comeback, I said, you're, you know, I didn't wait, wait, use the language I used, but uh, it was mad anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're crazy. Why would you want to do that? You know, you've, you know, Jason's got the, he's done it. He's got the records. He's, you know, he's got the t-shirt. Um, why would you want to come back and tarnish that? But like, at the end of the day, you know, we just, it just goes back, you know, to when we were growing up, we were just, we love racing our motorbikes. We'd rock. We'd ride between our houses on our dirt bikes and we'd make up little mini speedway tracks, on, you know, wherever we were. And we'd, you know, I, you know the, the guys that we'd idolize, we'd do practice starts and we'd try and name the rider and, you know, you know do their, like, their styles and sort of quiz who, who it is and stuff like that. So we just had fun racing motorbikes. So, but, you know, Jason went on to greatness in the, in the sport and, you know, like, fair play to him. Moldura is a name that, that we hear quite often. I mean, how important is Muldura? Um, how influential is it as a track? Yeah, they've got a, a, quite an amazing record, really, the, the, the amount of riders they produce from that little tiny town. Um, and if, you, if you've ever been to Madura, there's not a lot there, but um, if you play sport <laughs> or, you, or you grow you know, you know, grapes or uh, you know, in the citrus or like primary industry, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the place to be. But uh, we've got the river, so we go water skiing in the, the summer fishing if you're into that kind of stuff and um but like the motorsport um yeah they're just they they're one of the point the pioneers uh clubs that started the, the, the scale down um junior tracks and you know it just we had the, the great phil crump um come from there that was you know, he, he was a, you know the, the sort of the godfather for us when it comes to like going on the international stage and um but yeah, we all, we all wanted to be like little Phil Crumps racing on these junior motorbikes, and um, and then that, it's funny because the, the styles change because like then they all the, the junior kids wanted to be little mini Lee Adams, and, and like then there's a got that, that little mini Chris Holders or Jason Crumps, or you know, it's, it's it's funny how you see the different styles over the years. But um, yeah, it's just a great little motorcycle club that you know, pumps out a lot of you know great talent. What's it like riding alongside someone who? 
what you, you said that he was he had a mindset that he was going to be a world champion. You know, um, you know, I, I like to think that whatever we do or I do, I want to be very good at it. I want to be the best at it. To race beside someone who, you no, know, I, I want to be a world champion. I want to be top of the world. Not, I want to be okay in Mildura. I want to be okay in Australia. I want to go to Britain and be okay. I want to be world champion. You know, that, that's an incredible mindset for someone to have. What's it like to race alongside someone like that? I guess, um, you know, because like, I, 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 did, I didn't possess that, you know, and, and I think that's the difference. Like some people are sort of motivated and, uh, you know, you, you do need some sort of self-centeredness um, to, to, to achieve greatness like that. Um, I, I don't know. I, I didn't really think any different. You know, that's just how it was. And like, you know, at some sort of stage in my career, you know, I probably thought I could be world champion and, and probably deep down, I didn't really believe in it enough. Um, and then before the injuries set in, but I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, I don't know, there's, there's some people are just, you know, you sort of, that's their makeup, that's what they want and they, they go on to achieve it. And I'm, like, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I possibly couldn't have been world champion. I, I just probably didn't want it bad enough and, you know, didn't truly believe believe that I wanted to be world champion, wasn't prepared to be world champion. I think that's the biggest difference. And there's a lot of, there's a very small percentage of people that actually are prepared to want to be the best and, and, and put them themselves in the line. And like, I, I mean, I seen the hardships that Jason went through uh, and a lot of the criticism he, he went through at, at certain times, you know, we kind of, we talk about he's a three time world champion, but there was probably more failures and, you know, success on that path. But, um, you know, we just remember the good times. So, um, you know, that's, yeah, I, I, it's, you know, some people are a bit more humbled about the way they go about their life, and um, you know, and I think probably you, you didn't need a bit of an ego too. I think to be quite honest, to be quite successful, and I probably lack that. So we're going to the other side of the world now for your next rider, all the way to California, and it's another world champion this time from 1993. Who have you got as your third rider? Uh, I've got the American Southern Sam Omelenko. Um, like if anyone's watched Sam race, he's one of the most flamboyant, colourful um, races of all time. And I think like, uh, and like Sam became a, you know, a personal friend of mine and still is to this day. And, and like uh, Sam, Sam, I remember Sam coming to Madura and like I was a young sort of kid, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed and watching the Speedway stars come there. And, and uh, you know, fortunate enough, I had a bit to do with him there and, and his family actually ended up staying at our, our parents' place. So we got to speak a lot more. And he was the one that actually said to me, you know, you, know, you should uh, come to England. And, um, you know, and that's kind of why my journey sort of started really because I, I was just a young kid, raced in motorbikes, but I had, a, I had dreams of being an Aussie rules footballer. So, you know, I was like, really? You know, like th th I could do this? And that sort of so in the scene with Sam, but like, you know, not to distract from why I picked Sam, Sam, you know, like, one of the best in the business, you know, should he won more world championships? Quite possibly. Was he lucky to win that one in 93 against you know, Hans Nielsen? Who knows? But, you know, he just had it, didn't he? He could gate, he could pass. He, you know, he had the style, the flair, and, like, his race suits were always pretty cool. And, you know, he, he was, a, you know, from Team America, it was like, it just, you know, Team USA, you just see Sam Omelenko, don't you? So uh, he's been a great servant to the sport and, um, you know, been a good friend too. And at number four, we're going to go to Denmark, and uh, this time uh, another world champion, four times world champion. There's a pattern developing here, Mark. Uh, <laughs> who have you got at number four? We've got the great Hans Hank Nielsen, now the professor. Um, and, uh, you know, like, I just remember when I was, like, a, a young kid, when I was racing junior speedway, it was, it was like Hans, Sam, um, Eric Gunderson, you know, probably John Cook. Um, Jimmy Nielsen, Per Jonsson. Uh, I, I remember these kids and like, like anything, probably when you're a young kid, they're sort of very influential when you, those years of, you know, you're, you're starting your development into a, a liking to a sport, you remember those guys probably the most. And uh, Hans was to me, the, you know, the, the black race suit with that echo, you know, sponsor and the, the, the garden engines. And uh, that's who I wanted to be, you know, like, but uh, it's, and then those races with, you know, Hans and Eric and, you know, they were just like the business, weren't they? And, and, and you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, never, he's one rider I never beat. I, I, I raced with him a couple of times and I led him a couple of times. And I remember we did an open meeting in Warsaw uh, on an Olympic track there in Warsaw. And I, I led the final actually and um, for about two laps and he proper just barrel rolled me into the fence. And, you know, like, you know, the, the no I remember the noise 
of his engine, you know, I could hear over mine when he come underneath me and like he proper moved me. So um, yeah, I never beat the guy, but uh, I had beat him as a manager, which was uh, bittersweet. As a young rider, um, there must be pinch me moments when you find yourself racing against these guys that as a, as a youngster you looked up to and where you're almost like your heroes on the track. Yeah, I think that's probably something that um, that probably affected me more. more I so because like I didn't feel like I should have been in this world racing motorbikes. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, and I still probably feel pretty uh, quite privileged and lucky right now to still be involved in the, the industry in motorsport um, because I don't come from a motorsport background. And um, yeah, so I'm rocking up to these guys with the tapes. You know, it, at those early early days of my racing, yeah, I was just like, I'm on the other, other side of the world and I'm like, you know, racing my, my heroes that I used to watch, you know, yeah, you do pinch yourself. And I, I remember sometimes standing on the, a rider parade on the center green and, you know, in a foreign country and looking around and thinking, man, I'm not worthy. I'm not, I shouldn't be here. I, I should be watching these guys. So yeah, that kind of probably didn't help out my, my progression uh, in the sport, but uh, I remember it fondly and, uh, you know, yeah, it's, like I said, it is quite pinching you know, when you get up there, but I go going back to Sam and Malinka. I, I just remember a time too in a race, and we were at Oxford, and I pulled up at the start gate, and um, I, I was in his box a little bit, you know, and he's like having a moan at the the, the start marsh, and I'm like, man, this is like my hero. He's like, you know, moaning at me, and then uh, anyway, so I pulled back, and I was off gate one, and and rolled back, and as I've come back into gate one, I I went on that line again. But by the time the marshal, the green light come on, the marshal walked away. Sam looked down and crossed from gate two to gate one and seen that I was in his box. And I was like, no! <laughs> you know, looked at me because I, you know, I just trapped him. I was like, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, so we, uh, we'll go to number five. Then we finally have found a rider who's not uh, it's per se Speedway World Champion, but it was a five-time World Long Track Champion and a, a world um, final runner-up as well. Who have you got as your fifth rider? Uh, we're going for like, the, the, the charismatic you know, Simon Wig. I mean, like, the, the Brit, like, there's no more British riders than, than Simon. Like, he wore his heart on his chest, and uh, he was just so flamboyant. And, like, that's why I, I remember, like, the same time of getting into Speedway and, and watching the internationals, and when they'd come to Australia, and we went to the Mr. Melbourne, and, like, you know, we were just, you know, fans of the sport that my dad loves watching Speedway and we were in Melbourne on holiday and we went to Mr. Melbourne, the big 600 metre showground and I watched Wiki down there just like, just smoke everyone and uh, he was just so talented on the, on the big tracks and then you know, obviously got racing against him and he's a, you know, it's, it's just a, a real loss to, to, to the world really that we don't have Wiki in our lives now um, and he, he passed away you know, way too you know, young and before his time but I'm sure he would be, you know, transforming this sport or adapting and modifying to, to, to be something better. And because he was a bit of a game changer, like, you know, he, he did the long tracks and, you know, he had all the, the best gear and the, the, the solid disc wheels and he was just changing and, and really showcasing the sport. And like, I mean, he was pretty handy on the long track, wasn't he? Like, and like, I mean, he comes second in the world. So like, you know, he's a, he was, he was just a star and like, um, and like, yeah, just a smashing bloke and good fun bloke too. Like, you know, you, you guys are probably, we go on like do tours and stuff like that. And we had the, the, the international series down under and like Wiggy would always be leading like the, the party. Like, let's go on, let's go and have a barbecue here and we go and find things and visit, you know, the, the, the sort of animal sanctuaries. And he had this, had this nature about him and get everyone together and having a good time. So, um, you know, it's just, um, he learned a lot in his short, short, short uh, life. And uh, it's just a shame that um, he's not here. Yeah, much missed. Much missed. At uh, number six, um, you head back to Australia. Um, someone else had a sad story in the end. Yeah, it's, it's like you, you see some talent come and, come and go. And, and uh, I, I, I've watched a lot of, lot of motorbikes and a lot of racing in, in my life. And uh, I've never seen someone as talented. And... Uh, and that's Darcy Ward. Um, you know, like he's, he's certainly missed to the sport. And we talk about game changers. Like he's, he was definitely a game changer. Like the way he rode the bike, the way he went out, like he's, he was um, flamboyant, said it, said it how he, he saw it. And, um, you know, 
he, he got his license taken off him, you know, for alcohol. He was, a, you know, he was a little bugger, to be quite honest, when he was younger. A uh, little shit, if I can say that. Uh, <laughs> but I think the, the, the thing that was really sort of, you know, devastating, you know, like it's, it's, it's I mean, like it's not tragic because he's, he's alive with us and obviously the injuries, you know, just horrible and uh, we don't wish anyone to be in that situation and i mean he's doing really well in his life now with his wife lizzie on the gold coast and he's just you know, he's got a really strong mentality and he's, he's one of the few that can probably cope with it but you know when he lost his license and they took away one thing that he thought that no one could take away and was his opportunity to go and race a motorbike that was a game changer because he went back to australia and he had 10 months off he trained he worked hard and, you know, he, he basically said, no one's going to ever do that to me again. And, and it changed him. And that, that lesson he learned from losing his license, you know, and we, we saw him come back, you know, absolutely scintillating form, you know, hardly dropping a point to anyone. And, I, you know, it's very easy to say he probably would have gone on to be multiple world champion or world champion. I, I have no doubt he would have done and probably maybe been the best that there probably ever was. But it, 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 it humbled him in a sense and it's given him some direction now that 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 that, that loss of his license um, has put him in a place now that he can he can probably deal with a lot of things that can thrown at him and certainly dealing very well but like I, I just remember coming to, to Bellevue and uh, when I was managing and you know he put a thousand people on the on the turnstiles you know he was changing the sport so we, we lost a real star when when, it, when Darcy got injured but um, what he could do on a motorbike was pretty sensational. And, and he just had this, this knack, Darcy, just he could flick the switch. You could be joking around and telling, you know, him horsing around in the pits and then all of a sudden he just go out on that bike and he'd boom, nail it, you know, and then come back in and go, oh, do you see that? You know, got a bit loose there and, <laughs> and joke. And yeah, he was just a real good fun guy. Well, we're going to complete a uh, quite phenomenal one to seven uh, with yet another world champion four times um, world champion and again we're heading back over to America uh, who have we got this thing? We've got Greg Hancock um, yeah like I said four time world champion and like it, I sort of undeniable not about Greg quite honest because like you know, he is a four time world champion but like I think you know he's, he's, his later years um, you know to, to be as dominant as he was and you know and, and do what he did in his you know twilight years beating the younger guys is, is, is super impressive and like, I mean, he won the world championship, you know, at a relatively young age, um, but it took him, you know, what was it, 13 years or something to win the, win the next one. So well, there was a, you know, a lot of lulls in there, you know, where Greg was sort of like questioning his probably own um, place in, the, in the, the top line of the sport. But, you know, anyone that can go out there and, and replicate and certainly go and win four, you know, I think they're worthy of, uh, certainly worthy of place in my team but, um, and like he's a cool guy too Greg and like he's an entrepreneur he's doing into it he's into everything and now he's like helping the kids out in the states and uh, yeah he's, he was just always a good fun guy and like we did many a, many a road trips with Greg and you know he was always pretty cool to hang out with so yeah he gets a nice Mark that's your one to seven we've got your seven riders there um, who's your team manager who's looking after them all keeping them in order now, that's a pretty easy one for me um, you know, Neil Street you know Bill, he was just a star. Like um, he was, he, for, for me, he saw something in me that uh, you know, got me to England that probably no one else saw. Um, like I said, I wasn't really into to coming to race in, you know, in Europe, but uh, he kind of sat me down and says, Look, you know, I think you know, you'd be worth a shot to come over and, and try and take your chances and come to England because I think there's something about you. And, you know, so when someone like of, of Bill sort of says, that, that to you at a young age, you sit back and you're going like, "Whoa, hang on, well maybe there's something in this." So, um, and he was just a an inspiration when he spoke to you. You listened because you know he'd been there and done it, got the t-shirt, and he just he just knew how to like talk to you and, and get the best out of you. And um, yeah, he was just great. And obviously, he was the national coach for for, for us Aussies, and um, he was just a you know he was the godfather for Australian speedway there for us. So but, you know, he sadly missed, but. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I hear myself saying some things that he, Bill used to say to me as a you know, young, young rider with the riders now that I, I work with. So it's, um, I probably picked up a lot from Bill. But yeah, he was just a smashing, smashing guy. And he always made you feel home from home. 
you know, when we were over, you know, you, you knew what it like was like for a, a young Aussie who's been so far away from home. So that was always nice to catch up with Bill on the road. But there are some other guys that you want, you want to make a kind of notable mention of. Um, Eric Gunderson, Ivan Major, Per Johnson, Phil Crump and Sean Moran. Uh, five guys who would walk into uh, anyone else's team, I could imagine. Um, you know, you must have a pretty impressive one to seven if Ivan Major can't even make it in there. Yeah, well, I, ne- I never raced against Ivan. I, I raced for him on his um, long track series, but I never raced with him. But like anyone that can be... Uh, you know, a six-time world champion, and like, and especially when they have to qualify every year, it's pretty impressive. But you know, I, I, I I'm not really much of a fan because I didn't know much about Ivan. I'll be perfectly honest. But when you know, I, I came to know him later in, uh, in his life, and you know, when I, I read that uh, the will to win, you know, and you just realise like, man, no one gave Ivan those titles. You know, he proper earned them. You know, and I'm sure every world champion does. But like. You kind of think six time world champion. He must have had the best kit. He must have been just a bit better than everyone else. But no, I think he worked harder. But and Eric and the same thing. Like you know, it's top and turn with with Eric and Hands. You know who I pick. But uh, and I've, I've obviously I got to come friends with Eric and he works really hard with the Danish juniors and doing great jobs. And and Per Jonsson, like one of the most classiest, smoothest riders I've ever seen on this planet. You know, and you know it's such a shame that his career was cut short. And he's such a great guy. But, uh, and Sean Moran, flamboyant American, um, you know, we love Sean, good friends with him, and uh, he used to come and stay at our place, you know, in the summertime. So he's always helpful and uh, just a great guy. Like, and he was just a superstar back in the 80s and, you know, 90s. And obviously Phil Crump. I, I can't leave Phil Crump out. He should have probably been in my one to seven. I feel bad for not having him in there because if it wasn't for Phil Crump, you know, I wouldn't be racing Speedway. You know, he was just the legend around Madrid and, He'd blow away all the stars every time they come down the International Masters or the Durham Masters. And, you know, he was just a hero and of mine. And, um, you know, we're, we're good friends now to this day, which I can, I'm proud to say. So, Mark, one of your one to seven phones you up one night and says, I can't make the meeting. Which one of your standbys gets the place in the team? Uh, which one? I think you'd probably have to go with... Uh, I'd go with Phil. You just know he's ever reliable. You know, he's just going to be there, rock up, doesn't matter what it is. He's just going to go guns a blazing. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd go Phil. And if you had to name a team captain? Uh, team captain? I'd probably, you'd have to go probably Hans, the big Hank. You know, he was just the professor, wasn't he? So, yeah, top man. 15, Mark. Yeah. Which two riders do you nominate? Whoa, depending on what Grippy or slick? Of course, it's a big or small track. Right? <laughs> it's a big or small track. So I, I think you'd go for the big, big Tony, TR. You'd have to put him out there and, uh, you know, and like, well, I'll throw Darcy Ward off the, off the worst gate because I know you'll, you'll, you'll come from the back. No problem. Some of these are, are pretty impressive, Liam, aren't they? Some of these Heat 15s you see they these duos. They and, you know, there wouldn't be many out there that would, uh, that would stop them, but uh, yeah, a, a very, very impressive one to seven uh, has to be said. A lot of world champions in there, and uh, you would certainly pay your money to go and see that team. Yeah. And what would you call that team? What would I call it? I don't know. I was going to say like the Inv- Invincibles, you know, named after the 1948 Australian cricket team. You know, the, the, thump, you know, <laughs> the thumbs. <laughs> Just before we finish off, Mark, we like to do a, kind of, a, a quick fire round, ten questions that we ask everyone, um, and just a, a, a quick answer. As you can. So, number one, uh, your last time on a speedway bike. I don't know what year it was. It, uh, it must have been maybe 2016, 17, maybe 17. Um, it, 17. Uh, Madura Motorcycle Club had their 70th, 70th anniversary. So, I, I did, well, I was supposed to do a couple of demonstration rides, but they, when I rocked up there, it was, um, they threw me in a race. So, <laughs> it's, uh, gate four. I think it was gate four, heat four. And I won it. So, it was like, hey. <laughs> Okay, Mark. Um, do you have a lucky or a favourite helmet colour? No, I don't think so. No, I never really give it too much. I, I used to love the painted helmet, um, helmets that uh, I used to get Steve Masters down in Swindon. Lionel used to paint them, so I wasn't really a fan of helmet, helmet colours, and I, I like to see them go, to be quite honest. But uh, no, 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 no favourites. Favourite gate number? Always like the outside. If it was, you know, you, the track was suited, you, got, you always got a nice run, but um, I, I'd probably was better off the inside, you know, because I could, I wasn't the, the fastest guy, so I could just get in there and block everybody. Okay, tea or coffee? 
Um, I'm a coffee man, but you know, I, I do have the occasional cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, if you hadn't been a speedway rider, what would you have been? Uh, I would I would have said an Aussie rules footballer. Um, uh, did you go I'm, with Did you go with speedway because it was safer? I, I know one thing. I felt better the next morning. Um, you know, after playing a game of Aussie Rules, like on a, on a Sunday morning, you wake up pretty pretty sore. Right. Mark, your favourite pastime or hobby? My favourite pastime? Oh, God, I've just been so engrossed in speedway. I haven't, I haven't got it. I mean, I bought some golf clubs that I haven't played at all yet with. Um, I like going out motocross riding. I like water skiing uh, when I go home. I, I love that. Um, you know, other sports, I like all sports, you know, like the national hunt, you know, the, the horses. Um, yeah, I like, I like the motor GP, anything motorsport, I, I like watching. So, yeah. Favourite film? Awesome. Should have given me a bit more notice than this one. I've got <laughs> favourite film? Um, film. Uh, yeah, I watched The Australian Dream as a documentary about Adam Goods. That was pretty intense and, um, you know, really home hitting. Um, but yeah, I, I liked anything. Will uh, not Will it was um, um, the Talladega Nights. You know, with, oh, uh, Will Ferrell. Yeah, yeah, Will no, Ferrell. Anything easy. I, I love watching so. A race suit or race jacket? Suit by far. Uh, I mean, I, I like the, the traditional jacket, but you know, as a rider, you used to like to get a suit, don't you? Worst thing about Speedway? By far, injuries. Um, yeah, I lost. Lost a lot of lot of friends, um, and obviously, you know, seen a lot of guys get seriously hurt, and you know, we, we forget how dangerous the sport can be. I mean, I know that kind of what draws your attention. You know, as I, I know, as I was a young kid, you know, it's dangerous, and you know, you want to get in there. But the injuries is really, yeah, you know, the, the downside to the to the sport. You know, I, I had a lot of injuries in my career. I felt like I ra raced my whole career injured, um, but you know, it's it's nothing to the guys that have had you know serious you know you know sort of life-changing injuries that are in wheelchairs so yeah definitely the injuries is the worst mark what about the best thing about speedway uh that's easy winning um yeah obviously riding the bikes great i mean uh and get, get being all in one with the bike and having that racing that's pretty cool but i think you know the winning feeling that you get you know that relief you know because you what you probably don't see a lot is that um a lot of the, the anxiety or the build up beforehand you know, it's not, not pleasant, but uh, when you finally you know, cross that line, you get that checkered flag or you, you get to lift a trophy, that's, that's the buzz that makes it, makes it all worthwhile. Well, what's, what, what gives you the biggest satisfaction when you, you get across the line and lift the trophy or when you get across the line and realise you've beaten one of these um, legendary riders who were your heroes? <laughs> that didn't happen too often, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I mean, depending, you know, what what it is and how much effort you've put into you know, I think that's 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 the real when you kind of look back of the what it's taking you to get to to win that that race or that that championship or lift that trophy uh, I think that reflection that sort of that moment um, that it just it, the the past just flashes by you and it's like you just know how much effort you've put in to to win because it doesn't come easy uh, and I think that's just that that release that satisfaction feeling it's 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 money you can't buy it. It's um, it's the best thing, but uh, we just don't get enough of it. Mark, thank you very much for joining us and give us a little insight into into your Super Seven. Um, it certainly would be one a formidable uh, speedway team, that's for sure. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Liam, as well. And we'll be back uh, soon with another uh, edition of uh, Super Seven. Thank you.